Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. This is episode 55. We have a decidedly Scottish theme for today's episode, and that starts with our interview guest, Di Gilpin, who is a UK-based designer living in Fife in Scotland. Di Gilpin is a fascinating lady who's had an amazing, diverse career in the knitting industry. She started on the Isle of Skye, uh, designing bespoke garments on commission. She's trekked through the Himalayas, knitting with locals in remote villages. She's, she started a research project collecting the stories and patterns of Gansies along the, the coastline of Scotland. And she's worked together with top fashion houses designing for the catwalk, including having her work featured in Vogue fashion. So she's an amazing woman and it's therefore an amazing interview, which I'm sure you're going to really love. Yep. We're introducing a new segment called Meet the Shepherdess, and that takes us today to Prince Edward Island, which is the home of Anne of Green Gables yeah. in Canada, to meet two fantastic women who left their corporate jobs in the city to become shepherdesses and yarn producers. I'm also going to give you a review on Alice Starmore's latest book, Glamourie. We've got some beautiful footage taken from Muckle Row in Shetland to share with you. And of course, we've got our own projects to give you an update on. Yeah, we're going to start with that in Under Construction. So I showed you last week or last episode uh, this design here, which I've now completed the back section of. And this is Heartened by Kim Hargraves from her latest book, Calm. It's knitted in the Rowan Soft Yak, which is a combination of cotton and yak. I've used this yarn before. It's a really good yarn for making cables pop and, and showing textured patterns. Yeah, and it's a nice summery sort of yarn, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, summery enough. Yeah. <laughs> so the colour I'm using, because I'm in my orange phase, it's called Pampas, which is kind of a weird name, isn't it? I don't know what it means. So here we go. I'll show you a picture of it. It's a cute little fitted jacket that sits in your waist and it's got three quarter sleeves and it's basically just a combination of cables and seed stitch and you can see that the seed stitch here is um, increasing in between the the cable patterns and that gives you the shaping the waist shaping so i think it's a very cute little pattern so there's three different types of cables that are used in, in the pattern. There's the honeycomb cable and there's three of those right in the middle. That's a very common cable. And then there's a simple three by three cable twisting to the right and it's mirror twisting to the left. And then there's a little cable which I call the snake, which is like a four stitch cable where a column of two stitches just zigzags on top of the other two stitches without ever having to twist underneath. I, I think that's a very cute cable. And then, of course, you've got the seed stitch panels in between. Yeah, so the most difficult part of the pattern is actually just the setup rows. They take a fair bit of concentration, but once you've got that, it's actually very easy to memorize because it's so symmetrical. And anything that's symmetrical, it's pretty easy to read your knitting and memorize the pattern. So it's, it can be a, a TV knit, and it's definitely a lot of show for little work, which is a good, a good pattern. Yep. Good bang for your buck. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm happy with how it is. Sometimes people have trouble when they're knitting away on their cables, actually reading how many rows they've done if you've lost count. And so, but there is a really simple method of doing that. And I'll, I'll show it to you here on my knitting. If you have a look at where the cables cross and we'll take this three by three cable and there's a crossing here. What you do is you take your finger from behind your knitting and you try to poke it through a hole. You try to find a hole and the large hole, you should be able to find a large hole and there's mine right by where the, the crossing took place. And then you're going to count the ladders on the left side of the cable. So the very first ladder is the row that you crossed the cable and then each following row or each following ladder is a row that you've worked since that crossing. So if you've lost your place, you can't remember how many rows you've done, that's an easy way to count. So I really love how the cables pop out with this yarn and I'm showing you now a photo where you can see it from the side view and you can see that the cables are really quite high. So that's fun to see. Yeah, so that's my back piece, which I'm very happy with. And I've started one of the sides and yeah, it's Looking gonna look good, good, isn't it? Yep, 
So what have you been doing? So my project, as everyone knows, is the Welk by Martin Story, my vest. So you can see I've um, made a bit of progress here. I'm really pleased. <laughs> I have separated for the V-neck here. So you can see I decrease for the V along the next side. And I'm also doing the shaping along the armhole here. And at the same time, I've kept the pattern going. So my wandering three by three rib. I think as far as I can see, I've done all of that without any mistakes, even while watching some pretty good television. So I'm really <laughs> pleased about that. Um, it is always scary for me when it says in the pattern at the same time. So yeah. I have to decrease here at one rate and decrease there at a different rate. And But I think it's good. So I need to do that on the other side, of course. Um, finish up on that direction and then after that it's a matter of stitching it together. This is the back piece. Front piece, back piece, they come together and then um, picking up the stitches around the arm. I always say armhole here but that's the neck and around the armholes here. Yeah. Um, picking up stitches is also something that's still a little bit scary for me. I always wonder about exactly where to go but you'll be helping me with that. Definitely. And if all of that goes well and if the weather's not really hot like it is now. You have um, to rib the rib first. I have to rib the rib, yeah. <laughs> so pick up and then rib the rib. If all that goes well, I'll be sitting here wearing it. Maybe a little bit warm because it is summer here in Germany. I think you have to at least put it on for show. Yeah, I'll certainly put it on. I'll be yeah. looking very smart. We'll probably be drinking champagne too. Right. And you probably You'll will as well. Champagne too. Yeah, that's <laughs> to true. To know that it's finally finished. So that's my best. <laughs> Well, well done. Yes. Okay, so coming up now is part one with our interview with Di Gilpin. Di Gilpin is really one of the most fascinating people I've had the privilege to interview. It's been both uh, easy and challenging to interview Di. Easy because she's done so much, so there's a heap of great content that she can just talk about. But challenging for the same reason, because we have a certain time frame and we have to make sure that we cover it or stay within that time frame, but still do a good overall uh, view, overview of everything that she's done. Yep. So I think you should really enjoy it. We've divided the interview in two parts. Part one is coming up now, part two at the end of the program. So enjoy it and we'll see you on the other side. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. My guest today is the UK knitwear designer Di Gilpin. Di has had an extremely interesting career full of contrasts. For 18 years she lived very remotely on the Hebridean Isle of Skye, working with local craftspeople and knitting on commission. She's also spent time in Spain and trekked through the Himalayan mountains visiting monasteries. And in contrast to that carefree and simple lifestyle, Di has also worked under high pressure with major fashion houses, creating hand-knitted couture collections for the catwalk. I met Di for the first time at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival earlier this year and found her to be very open and friendly with a really delightful personality, and I'm sure you're going to think so too. So Di, it's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrea. It's really so kind of you to, to ask me. It's great. Thank you. So the career paths of some highly successful designers are really interesting and surprising and this is the case for you because you didn't study design formally but you have ended up designing in collaboration with top fashion houses all around the world. So just as an introduction, can you talk about some of the parts of your career that helped you learn your skills? Well, yes. Um, I don't have a formal training um, in arts or in textiles but by sheer chance, um, stroke of luck really, I ended up on the Isle of Skye in 1983, gosh, 35 years ago, with a backpack, a set of needles and some wool, and six months to take out from a busy teaching career to try something different. And I set up a small studio there quite quickly and started developing my interest in knit. I've knitted since being really quite tiny, so... I knew a lot about it already, but um, as you know, knitting is just such an enormous subject. Um, I thought it would be great to have six months to, to learn as much as I could. So I started taking apart jumpers that people gave me, old traditional 
fair isles and and things like that so taking them apart finding out how they were constructed reconstructing them using the yarn but giving it a different twist each time so that they were a little bit more contemporary I learned an awful lot about how people sewed things up about seamless knitting um, about use of colour particularly in the older fair isles that I have in my collection from this tiny studio people started dropping in from all over the world and I was sharing it with um, an amazing wood engraver that I'm going to talk about later. And people would drop in, see me knitting and ask them to ask me to make them something. So I developed um, a real interest in bespoke knitting, you know, choosing colours for people, choosing designs, usually my own, and making them to fit. So you can imagine the variety of sizes and people that came through the door, men, women, sometimes children that wanted something special made and for different reasons as well. Um, somebody wanted a full length jacket coat that they could take to the New York Opera and I, I made that and lined it with hand painted silk by another maker on the island. Um, so we had some really interesting projects coming through. And that really helped me learn so much about the history of knitting and also how things were made, how to make things um, to fit people perfectly. So Di, you mentioned working with this wood engraver in Sky. Um, you've had a few different inspirational sources over the years that have really impacted your designing. So talk about the working with the wood engraver and then a few of the other inspirational sources. Yeah, well, I think I was just really fortunate to be asked by Cathy Lindsley, who um, has the Raven Press on Sky, to join her in her little studio. And because she taught me so much about art and about how to draw properly, how to keep books of inspiration, how to go out and draw the landscape and geology and things that I was really interested in, and by doing that, I began to see the pattern in everything, patterns in everything. Um, and that helped with my design process. And, you know, so when I was making, I was becoming more and more influenced by my drawing. And to make the more complicated patterns, I used charts. And I still do. I still hand draw everything onto large mathematical graph papers and where each square represents a knitting stitch. And what Cathy taught me by watching her engrave is that each little mark that she used with a different tool onto her wood block became a mark on when it was printed. And you'd have different layers from um, dark, the dark areas on the wood block would print black. The areas that had been manipulated with the different tools would print to light grey or to white. So you could see the balance in a picture in black and white. So I used the same principle on my charts using little symbols, um, say a filled in square for an area that I wanted to have a very dark colour in it and a little line or an open circle for a light colour. That way, when I was drawing out the charts, people would be able to see, I could see, the balance in the colour work in, in, in the design. And I think this really helped me create very beautiful colour combinations simply through seeing how they worked in black and in white. It gave complete balance to the picture. So I learnt so much from just studying Cathy and watching her working and the beautiful pictures that she created. And a lot of them were also inspired, a lot of her work was inspired by the sheep in the area and by the natural world. And so it was a huge inspiration to me. I've got a little booklet here, actually, which which she gave me, which is called Yantan Tetherer. And it's the counting system that they use in Cumbria for um, counting sheep. And you can see all the beautiful little wood engravings in there. And you can see the light and dark and how it works. How beautiful. Yeah, it's really, really very special. Um, and she created the um, symbol for my business, for the company, right the way back in 1984. And that's the bellwether 
which is the ram engraving with the big bell on a yoke under his under his neck, uh, which is a Jacob sheep. And I loved it because the Jacobs has got all the different colours, natural colours within one fleece. And that really represented the sort of work that I was doing then. Lots of intarsia, multicoloured um, designs. And it just seemed a perfect image to represent my work. I still use that today as well, which is really amazing. Yeah. Okay. And what about Sonia Delane? Because she helped you or she influenced you with her connection with poetry and painting, didn't she? She did. Um, I'm a huge fan of art and I was lucky enough to be in Paris um, as a student and went to the Musée de Tokyo. This is in the late 17, uh, about 79, and saw her work and her husband, Robert Delaunay, and I just fell in love with her and what she was doing. Well, you know, she died in 74, but she worked all the way up until her death, and she didn't restrict herself to paintings and drawings. She painted whole cars, and she designed fabrics for Coco Chanel, and she also made costumes for different ballets and operas and such like. And so I was fascinated by her as a woman artist, really. So I discovered that she'd worked a lot with poets and I love poetry and I have worked with quite a few poets myself. And she um, made a beautiful book for the poet Apollinaire, which described his, his words in colour and form and shape. So alongside the poetry in the book, Sonia had created these beautiful flowing shapes and forms and colour, which represented the mood and the words of the poetry. And this became known as the Simultanee movement, which had a huge influence on me. When she designed fabrics and clothing, clothing designs, she would put form and shape into those pieces which showed movement and the movement of the body. And I was really keen to explore that so that when I make a design like the one I'm wearing at the moment, which is the, the original Delaunay, um, I like to put the, the shapes and forms so that they, they move with the body. So it gives you a fluidity in, your, in, in, in what you're wearing. And so that had a profound influence and also her use of colour. And she's a fantastic colourist and uses really pure colour. And I really do try to, you know, work in the same way as her so that you get layers of colours, but then also very pure colours um, breaking in to the design. So, yeah, she had a huge influence on me. And um, thinking about Delaunay, the, the, the other great influence in my life, and it's been very interesting kind of thinking back to that period, was a period that I spent in Ladakh, in the Himalaya. And when I was younger, I used to do an awful lot of long-distance walking and cycling, and was really fortunate to go up to the Himalaya uh, to do a two, three-month trek through very remote valleys and villages, um, and working with some of the local people on hand knitting, which was an amazing opportunity. And I just absolutely adored the landscape, and you know, it was you'd be walking along a really remote valley, and you'd see strange sea creatures in in the rocks that you were walking past, and these were actually ancient seas that, with the mountain movement, had been pushed up to the top of the mountains. So it was a quite surreal and ex exciting experience, quite arduous as well. So I'd be walking along with my little rucksack in the front and my tent in the back in a in a rucksack. And I'd have my knitting on top and I kind of I'd taken some hand spuns with me and I'd picked up some hand spuns. And I used to knit little gifts on these long walks that I could give to people that we were staying with. And we'd we'd stop into quite a lot of the beautiful gompers and monasteries, and there were some amazing tankers or paintings within the monasteries, with um, for example, the Buddha painted with fantastic fabrics, wearing these beautiful symbols. And some of those symbols um, I began to incorporate into my work, like the Yongdung, which is a, a symbol of um, happiness and, and good health. I started putting those small symbols into some of the designs. And um, 
a lot of people wouldn't know they were there. But for me, it was like passing on um, something special to people that bought one of my pieces, that there was something knitted into it. It's a story knitted into the piece. So it was, um, I just so enjoyed being in that space. It was a very soulful space. And the walking, we would walk all day at high altitude, which is quite difficult. So I found with the knitting and walking that I would go into a very meditative state. And that was a great enabler for me because it gave me focus. And I found, I even find now that when I'm knitting, I can go back into that space, which is a very creative space. It's when my mind's very open to ideas and to, so that I can contemplate each stitch and actually ask the stitch where it wants to go, what it wants to do. And in this very private space, I can um, develop ideas and develop patterns, ask questions um, and think a little bit out of the box. And I suppose tying in with that, you know, is my absolute love of maths and the beauty of numbers. And um, being able to see those things in a very 3D way so that my mind drifts off in this kind of meditation and I can see a garment and actually see it in 3D and how the stitches are going to work and how it's going to be constructed. Um, so I think I learned that probably in Ladakh, up in the high Himalaya, in this solitude and in this extraordinary environment where everything is precious. And what I loved about it is that working of man, working in harmony with nature. And that very much is, you know, is, is a part of all the work that I do. Well, Di, just listening to you, there is so much information here and I have to just tell the viewers that we're really, we have to keep moving on because your life is so full. I could already ask you a lot of questions about what you've said already, but I do want them to know a good overview of, of what you've done. So we'll move on. And my next question is um, about Gansey Knitting because you collaborated on a Gansey Knitting project where you set up clubs along the coast to help reconnect people with their knitting and fishing heritage. So say something briefly about this project, but then talk about the, Gan the Scottish Gansey and how it's constructed and what the meaning is of all the different parts. Yes, I was really fortunate to be asked by the Moray Firth Partnership um, to help develop a project, a Gansey project, collating lots of information from local villagers along the coastline from Aberdeen up to Wick. And the project took about four years and we were basically trying to find old Ganseys that might have been hidden away in attics or in drawers and cupboards and collect them before they got given to charity shops or thrown away. Um, and I think we just managed to be at the right time to collect about 90 Ganses and um, get some great recordings of people talking about remembering, you know, their mother's knitting or their auntie's knitting and who the Ganses were for and why a particular pattern was important to that family or that village. And it all was the whole collection was collated and it does travel now, which is exciting. And we produced a fantastic small booklet, which people can go onto the Gansey website and um, ask to have sent to them. It's just here. It's the Moray Firth Gansey project. And within it, there's some fantastic patterns that you can develop yourself. And um, online, there's a fantastic archive too. So you can design your own Gansey and build your own story into, into a piece. And we live very close to Pitt and Weem and Anstruther and to the amazing Fisheries Museum in Anstruther, where we have um, a beautiful collection as well of traditional Ganseys from Fife, which is the area that I live in myself. And I've got two here, which the, they have very kindly lent me from the museum. And I particularly asked for the pink one because you don't often see pink Ganses. Um, and I thought this is an absolutely perfect little example. And you can see we've got a very classic 
five pattern here with the kind of zigzag running up and down. Quite simple um, and very dense, very dense stitch work. The older the Gansey, often the denser the tension on the piece, up to say 54 stitches to four inches, which is incredible really. Um, and you can see from the Ganses that they're knitted seamlessly and they were knitted seamlessly um, so that they had great shape and form on the fishermen. They were also so densely knitted that some of these Ganses t fitted very tightly to the body. And the reason for that was when the men were out fishing, they didn't want their cuffs to get caught up in the rigging and the nets. So everything, you know, the cuffs were quite short and everything fitted very tightly. And in fact, when they came back from fishing, they often had to be pulled out of their gansies because they were almost stuck to them. The gansey has a beautiful little gusset, which I think you can see under here. This is a very simple one, but this enables the knitting to make it, sim you know, um, seamless because at this point you separate and create the gusset and knit up and then you pick up the stitches and knit the sleeve down. And um, there's some really nice detail across the saddle here. This one's got quite a high neck, which isn't as normal as, as the majority of Gansies. We've got another one here, which um, apparently won best in show at the Royal Highland Show in Edinburgh. And um, this one's got a quite interesting saddle running up and across into the shoulder and into the neck which makes it even more seamless. And you've got, um, you've got the herringbone here, stitches, which um, are quite a, a local feature. You've got some moss stitch. You've got these ridges. Um, and I've got here some beautiful examples from um, the Gansey Project showing some um, little knitted samples of classic designs from different areas. So this one is knitted um, in Banff, up on the uh, coast near Wick. And we've got another gorgeous little one here, which has got hearts made in, in it there. And um, that's the hearts, one from Fraserburgh, which is a big fishing port up on the northeast coast. I particularly love this, this little one. And what's really special about the Gansey is that is what love I love are these little joining lines in between. And each Gansey you can see has got very different ones. And I think they're more interesting in a sense than even the bigger patterns of the anchors um, or the church windows or the, um, the, fish, the, the nets, the, the Inverness diamonds pattern. I think the little patterns say an awful lot about each individual knitter and how they made their Ganses because they would they would look at a person and decide, oh, well, he's a, a 300 stitch Gansey or he's a 420, depending on their size and the tension that they had in their mind, which they knew inside out. And if somebody was a little bit bigger, they had to add in extra stitches to make it fit. And that's where the added stitches would be added into these little sections that run between the main patterns to give it ease. Um, and so I think it tells a really fantastic story about each individual knitter and how they made things. The creativity and the way they thought, definitely. Yes. So yes. Is a, lot of, uh, a lot of these patterns made out of just simple knit and pearls um, patterning? That's all it is. That's all it is. It's, it's a stitch work which raises itself above the surface of the knit because of the density of the tension. And they used a five-ply worsted spun um, wool, which is incredibly dense and almost shiny. Um, and that allows them to get the very dense tension. And with the dense tension, the stitches pop out. The pearl stitches on the knit side pop out and create the patterning. So it's, it's quite simple, but actually it's incredibly complicated too. Yeah.
welcome back. I hope you enjoyed part one of our interview with Di Gilpin. In part two, coming up later in the show, Di talks about her collaboration with fashion designers for the catwalk. And she also talks a bit about her couture studio in Fife, where she employs around 30 very highly skilled knitters. Yeah. I loved listening to her talk about the Gansey project. I, I found that quite fascinating because mm-hmm. we've said this on the, on the program before, but Andrew's family migrated from Fife in the 1840s to Australia, and they were all fishermen. Yep. So I think it would be fascinating to go to the archives and, and check out early Fife uh, patterns, Gansey patterns, and then design you a special... Di- um, a doy Gansey. Yeah. That would be great, Dallas. Yeah. 54 stitches. That's a challenge. Per 10 centimetres. <laughs> you going to do that? Well, I normally do about 28, 29 stitches for 10 centimetres, but, yeah, why not? I mean, I love the look of it. I yep, love the way sure. the, the stitches really pop out. But we could make it a family project. So you and Madeline could do a sleeve each yeah. and then I could do the body and then we'd have it done in no time. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting thought because probably some of those Gansies were knitted like that. Yeah, totally. That's amazing. Yeah. So we could do that. But I think the problem with that is there'd be some fights about who's wearing it at the end of it. Could be. <laughs> So I'm going to show you now Alice Starmore's latest book, Glamoury. It's a beautiful book. It's a collaboration between Alice Starmore and her daughter, Jade Starmore. And Glamoury is a Scottish word which means a charmed condition where everything has magical properties and possibilities. So Alice and Jade live on the Isle of Lewis, which is in the Outer Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland. And it's a really beautiful, remote, rugged landscape where there's a tradition of telling magical stories about animals that shapeshift into humans and other spirits. Some of them are male- male- malevolent. Malevolent. Yes. <laughs> I can never get that word out. <laughs> malevolent. So, and that's the amazing inspiration behind this book and this collection. So it's, first of all, Jade has written some stories or tales about these shape-shifting animals, and that's the inspiration for some costumes, and the costumes are of these animals, and the costumes in turn are the inspiration for the final 11 wearable designs and their patterns. So that's what the book incorporates. So I want to flip through the book now so that you can see some of the beautiful pictures inside. So every design is introduced with a short story written by Jade about the creature that inspired the design. And the stories provide a really excellent transition to the costumes, which then provide a good transition to the wearable designs. So Alice is showing you, in a sense, how her mind works as an artist and her designing process, because she says that normally when she designs, she lets her imagination elaborate on very fanciful ideas before she pairs everything down with the practical constraints and considerations of what's actually wearable or even what's gradable into a written pattern. And I think the difference here is is instead of just illustrating her inspirational ideas on paper, she's actually knitting up these amazing fanciful ideas into costumes before later designing the actual wearable design. So to me that just seems very similar to what fashion designers are doing with their over-the-top designs on the catwalk. So Jade is also a professional photographer and the photos are just simply gorgeous. They're all taken outside in front of the beautiful but simple landscapes that perfectly complement the costumes without taking away from them. And the same goes for the clothes that the models wear. Um, they're quite, they're very wearable designs, they're very beautiful, but they don't ever distract from the garment itself. And you can see on some of the photos that you've got, you, you see all different angles of the costumes, both close up and further away. So that's fantastic. In the first half of the book, in addition to the tales and the pictures of the, of the costumes, Alice also talks about her creative process behind developing the costumes. And as I said, in the second half of the book, you've got the 11 wearable designs and The patterns look to be very, very clear written and the charts are beautiful and open and easy to read. And also at the end, because Alice has used quite a lot of embroidery and felting, there's there's special information on on how to do the embroidery that's used. 
So it's, it's a very beautiful book, but let me show you some of my favorite designs. So I think my favorite in the collection is the damselfly, which is inspired by the tale of the otter and the damselfly here. It, the, and this is in a stunning costume. And what I really love is the broken abstract lines here. They really look like veins on the wings of insects and the bright emerald coloring of, of insects. And it's wearable design is is here so that's what she's paired it down to which I think is really beautiful it comes in two colorways but I'm going to do the blue so that's what I'm planning to knit for myself and this is a very simple version of a selkie cardigan I think it's very beautiful I love the coloring in it and I'd like to convert that to a jumper for Andrew so that's that's my plans so the quality of the book is really excellent I've got the hard quality the hardcover version here and it is such a high caliber knitting book you can't yeah. really even consider it to be a knitting book in a way it's it's very beautiful there has been some criticism about the book but i think that comes from a misunderstanding of what the book's actually trying to do some people have expressed disappointment that the co there isn't patterns for the costumes but these costumes are so intricate and they're full body many of them and if you yeah. could imagine writing a pattern, a detailed pattern that would properly guide you through the construction of one of these costumes, even if it was in only one size, you'd probably be looking at at least 30 pages. So if you're going to incorporate the tales, which are the inspiration for the whole book, and then pictures of the costumes, and then a design for each costume, and then all of the gradable, wearable costumes at the end, as well as the technical information, you'd end up being with a book that is far too large for it to be able to be published at a price anybody could afford. So yep. I think that's really an unre unrealistic criticism. I really love the way Jade styles her models in the publications of her books because the models she picks, they don't really pose or look like typical models. But once you've read the stories, you can see that the expressions and, and poses that the models are doing are really the characteristics of the animals um, in the stories yep. that, that, the, yeah, that the costumes are portraying. So to me, it's such a high caliber of, it, it really shows you the possibilities of hand knitting in the top end of design and, and couture and, yep. and costumes and art. So it's an incredibly valuable book for any designer who wants inspiration. In fact, I think it's a book that every library should have. Yep, sure. I read the um, credits in there and I know it took them three years yeah. to put the book together and the, the yeah. notes about actually doing the photography are pretty interesting because... Um, uh, the UK is not necessarily the easiest place to do outdoor no, with modeling wind shots. And cold. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it's an amazing achievement. But it's a, a totally beautiful book, and and I can just encourage you to get it to have it as a in in your collection as as something very valuable. So what's coming up now? Coming up now is extreme knitting, and in keeping with our Scottish theme, we're going to be taking a hike in Muckle Row, which is a very beautiful place on the coastline of Shetland. Straight after that is our new segment, Meet the Shepherdess, and the two women that we're going to meet there come from Nova Scotia. And so the that's Scottish the Scottish connection, connection. The Scottish connection <laughs> is that Nova Scotia means New Scotland. Yeah.
Galilee on we go, hill for hill and toe for toe. On and on and on we go, up from Barry's wedding. Plenty herring, plenty meal, plenty pig to fill the creel. Plenty barley vans as well as the toast from Barry. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Kim. Jennifer and I are sisters, and we're the owners of Fleece and Harmony Woolen Mill in Belfast, Prince Edward Island in Canada. We'll tell you a little bit about how we ended up being mill owners. We were born in Nova Scotia and went off into the big city to pursue our careers. I was working for a multinational cosmetic firm in sales and trade marketing. Jennifer was working for a huge telecom company in Toronto. And we were uh, living in their respective cities with our husbands and were becoming more and more disillusioned with the hustle and bustle of the city life and the long commutes to work and the stress of our lives and decided that it was time to come back closer to home to the Maritimes. But we weren't sure what we wanted to do. Uh, randomly or somewhat randomly, <laughs> we decided, well, farming sounds like it would be peaceful and nice. <laughs> So it so happened that I had a friend who was working in the insurance industry in Toronto 30 years before we were talking about this, and she actually made the same kind of lifestyle change and started a sheep farm in Quebec. So she offered to be our shepherd mentor, and uh, so that was all it took for us to say, yes, let's do it, and our husbands agreed, and we found a farm, which we currently live on in Belfast, um, it's 88 acres, and we have a mixed flock of um, sheep that we'll tell you a little bit more uh, about in a second. We're not spinning our wool at the beginning. We were sending our wool to be treated at the Belfast Mini Mill, which is just close, quite close to where we live. And they did a beautiful job of spinning our, our fleece for us into yarn, but then they decided that they weren't doing custom spinning anymore. We searched around for another mill that did as good a job on small batch um, milling as what the Belfast Mini Mill did and were not successful. So one thing led to another and uh, a little bit of, of more than a year and a half ago we actually purchased a full mill from the Belfast Mini Mill, built the building that it's uh, housed in and started our own uh, milling business. So our flock that we currently have is a Coradale Cross flock. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Coradale, it's the oldest crossbred breed. It was bred uh, simultaneously or developed somewhat simultaneously in both New Zealand and Australia. Um, and it's a cross of a Merino and Lincoln sheep. Uh, it's very sought after for felting and for hand knitting. The average microns of the fleece is about 25 to 30, and it gives you a three and a half to six inch staple length fleece. It's very, very cushy, um, it's very warm, and it's quite soft. We use the fleeces from other farmers on Prince Edward Island as well. Um, here on the island, the most popular breed is the Canadian Arcot. The Canadian Arcot is actually a really interesting story because it was developed by the government of Canada as part of an experimental program to optimize a sheep breed for use uh, in the Canadian climate and one that could be raised both indoors and out on pasture as desired. It's a combination of a lot of different breeds actually that they mix together to create the Canadian Arcot. 80% um, of it is made up of Suffolk, Ile de France and Leicester. And there's a bunch of other bits and bobs in there, including a little bit of Coradale, which is really interesting because now our, our cot fleeces are really getting back to their roots by being blended with our Coradale fleeces. We love using the Arcot fleece. It's surprisingly lustrous and white for a breed that's not actually bred specifically for the use in wool. Um, and it makes our yarn, because we only use the Arcot first clip, the lamb's wool, it makes our yarn very soft. So we spin those two types of fiber together. And at the same time, we're also um, experimenting with our own flock, um, adding different genetics all the time to improve the, uh, the wool quality and um, to 
uh, find to find a fiber uh, that is um, more and more consistent as we go. So we have um, border luster in our flock as well. So we're breeding the border luster with the uh, with the Corydale. And what's happening is that we have a fleece that's quite crimpy. And when we spin that into our yarn, we come up with a very soft and lofty uh, yarn. And then you have the lamb's wool from the Arcot, as Jennifer said. So it's, it's kind of a uni unique blend. We weren't sure how it was going to turn out, to be honest, we, but we had made a commitment that we would only use locally sourced fiber and that's what's locally uh, available. So here, here we are. And we should mention that Corridales were brought to North America in 1914, but are still considered a rare breed in Canada. So we're very proud to help carry on um, those genetics here at home in Canada. Right. So when we're spinning the uh, when we're spinning the fleece into yarn, we're blending 60% arcot with our mix of uh, our flox uh, fleece, and our main brand or main yarn that we're making is a three ply Aran weight. Um, as I mentioned, because of the qualities of the different fibers that we're putting in, it has a very lofty and I get the only way to really describe it is cushy, <laughs> cushy uh, feel to it. Um, it also has a little bit of a bloom um, when you after you've uh, knitted with it and then done your blocking and so forth. It's, it has a, a soft hand and uh, has a little bit of a bloom to it as well. It's exceptionally good for working in cables and in brioche. So any of those types of fabrics where you want to have a bit of texture. And it also has a very good stitch definition as well. Because we've only been open a year, uh, we are experimenting all the time. So now we're also experimenting with lighter weight yarns as well, um, working on a two ply and a three ply fingering weight. Um, it's a bit challenging because it's hard to get a really fine yarn because of the crimpiness of the fiber. So there's, there's a, a lot of things to contend with. Um, we also dye in the skein, so we're spinning, I'm spinning the, uh, the yarns and um, then we're skeining the yarns and then Jennifer takes over from there and does the, does the dyeing in the skein. Yeah, so our dyeing process is a bit unique, um, trying to dye the volume of uh, yarn that we produce in the skein. Um, but Belfast Mini Mills has developed a commercial dye vat, which makes it quite efficient, so I can do up to two kilograms um, of yarn at a time, at least that's the amount I'm comfortable with. Um, and we do use a special acid dye that was developed by another Belfast mini mill owner in Connecticut in the US and it's called Greener Shades and it's actually GOTS certified, which means it complies with organic trade standards. Um, it does only come in eight colors, which means I get to be a mad scientist and develop all of our tones and hues personally um, through experimentation and a little bit of color theory uh, and just taking really, really good notes so that we make sure it's reproducible. I really enjoy using the product. I think it's wonderful to be able to say that your dyes are organic um, certified. And I also love the freedom that it gives me to create as many different colors as I want without feeling the pressure to just order something off the page. The challenge of that is that it's really hard to kill a color once it's been yeah. created. <laughs> so yes, we have a I, big palette. <laughs> yeah, we're probably up to around 60 or 70 colorways. And as I always like to say, once one has been born, I can't kill it. <laughs> so our website just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just released eight more last night. So lots of colors to choose from, um, but you can never have too many. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll show you a couple examples of um, the, the items that surround us and what we're wearing are made from our yarn and dyed, dyed by us. So I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to talk about your sweater first, because that's... Yeah, for sure. So I'm wearing, uh, we love using our own wool. Actually, the first six months, we didn't really have time to knit. We were learning how to use the equipment. But the last six months, we've really had the opportunity to experiment with our own product. And it's been wonderful. And I love wearing it. Um, it just adds another level of satisfaction when you've also spun and dyed the yarn that you've knit up. Um, I'm wearing a Stephanie Jappel design, which is called the Ballerina Top, and it's in our color Vineyard. Um, it really shows off the ability of our um, yarn to show off stitch def definition in cables. Um, our Aran weight is best with probably a five and a half to a six and a half millimeter um, needle, and it gives a really nice, loose, soft, comfortable fabric for a sweater. What Kim's wearing is a design that's going to be released by Fleece and Harmony shortly, and it's done by a local designer named Cheryl Wartman. 
Um, it's called the Beach Day Scarf, and it's in our Blue Poppy, which is a really popular colorway. As you can see, it's quite striking. Um, we have a couple of shawls that we did up for our spring color launch called the Meadow Collection. Um, this is the White Caps Shawl by Ash Alberg, and it's done in our, one of our fingering experiments, which we have in sort of limited supply at the moment, but we hope to make more soon. Um, this is another shawl by Ash, and it's called Reflect. Um, and it's done up in our air and weight in one of our new spring colors called Twilight. And then we have the beautiful to the point um, shawl by Heidi Kermar, which we thought would show off the lovely gradient quality of some of our new spring colors. Um, and that's the one at the back. We should also mention that our, all of the color names that we've chosen for our shades are based on things that we see locally as well. So keeping with the theme of local, um, as many of you may know, Prince Edward Island is the land of Anne of Green Gables. So obviously um, some iconic um, names come from th those stories. So I'm holding Raspberry Cordial, for example. And for every color um, uh, way that we've designed, we've also uh, tell a little bit of a story about the, about the color. Um, it's been fun and challenging because we'll have colors that we uh, that we want to call a yarn, but if we can't find a reference to that color locally, then we have to figure out a different name. So that's been, that's been a bit, uh, like I said, uh, challenging um, but fun. This um, skein also um, illustrates really well that this is a solid skein, but there's the tonal quality of the dyeing because of the different blends of the fibers that um, that we're using. So I think that's the details about our yeah <laughs> about our mill. Um, we're just thrilled to be able to uh, to be uh, featured on Fruity Knitting. So for Meet the Shepherds, yes, yeah, for Meet the Shepherds. Yeah, we are very much shepherds first, and looking after our sheep is is one of the most satisfying parts of everything we do. Um, we're proud members of that group of people who have invited sheep into their lives. Um, there's 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 no downside to it. We love everything we do, um, and we're enthusiastic knitters, and we're big fans of the podcast, and we're very thankful that Andrew and Andrea asked us to be on it. So I guess we'll say goodbye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks very much to Kim and Jennifer. What courageous women giving up their jobs in the city, the safe yeah. jobs, going out and buying a farm and the sheep, the stock. And, and the then, mill. And the mill um, to produce their fleeces and then their own yarns. Um, I'm sure it's really a great adventure. A lot of ongoing work, I must say. I, would, I can see the attraction, but I would also be concerned about keeping up with it all. Keeping up with the work. Yeah. I think it'd be hard if you're a farmer and something happened to you physically and then you just couldn't get out and do the work. Yeah, there's that. There's yeah. no, you know, the sheep aren't going to wait. And also looking after the livestock. You know, yeah, you've got the well-being. I reckon it would be fun too. I, I'm a little bit envious. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I always find when someone comes around, I always think, oh, I'd love to have a job outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've been looking around for the right yarn to knit Kate Davies' Carbeth or, or for Madeline to knit it because she wants to knit it. And their Aran weight yarn is just perfect for that design. And as you know, I'm doing a little bit of a, an orange thing here. I've got an orange face orange happening. Face. And Madeline totally loves deep, reddy, orangey colours. So together we picked out a deep, reddy, orangey colour. Mm -hmm. And we've got that yarn coming to us. So it's on its way. So that's very exciting. That's cool. Yeah. So that's going to be a new project for her. Yep. So Kim and Jennifer are offering our patrons a 15% discount on everything in their online store. And in their store, you will find all of their yarns as well as a few patterns and some notions and some yarn-related pottery. So thanks, Kim and Jennifer. That's fantastic. We would also like to remind our Shetland and Merino patrons that we have a live event with Kate Athley coming up on the 10th of June. Kate Athley is Nitty's managing technical editor and author of the book Custom Socks Knit to Fit Your Feet. We interviewed Kate back in episode 51, so this is your chance to ask her advice on all your difficult sock fitting questions. 
We really do appreciate the ongoing support of our patrons and we are thrilled whenever we're able to say thank you to them by being able to offer them discounts or these live events. And as I say every episode, this is my full-time work and Andrew helps me considerably on top of this. We love to be able to bring you high quality content on such a regular basis, but it is a ginormous amount of work and that's only possible with patron support. So if you are watching our show regularly, then please do become a patron because you can do so for just a small amount each month. Thank you. So coming up now is part two of the interview with Di. It's very exciting. She talks about her small team of highly skilled knitters and collaborating with top fashion houses and the catwalk. We get to see some of that. It's, it's very exciting, as I yeah. said. One thing she didn't talk about much in the interview, but when, during her time on Sky, she worked with the Harris Tweed industry and helped them develop a hand knitting yarn and she brought them together with Rowan yarns and the result of it was the Rowan Scottish Tweed. It's since been discontinued but it was a beautiful yarn so for those of you who know it, Di Gilpin was behind that yarn. Recently she's developed uh, two, two types of yarn for herself. One of them is 100% Scottish lamb's wool and that's called her Larland lamb's wool. It's a beautiful yarn. And her other yarn that she's developed is a blend of Scottish uh, wool with cashmere. And that's really beautiful. And that's called Saos. Yep. Mongolian cashmere. Yeah. I read. Yeah. Gorgeous. Yep. So Di is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off all of her yarns, her kits and her patterns everything in her online store, which is absolutely fantastic. So we're very grateful for that. And Di will be talking more about her yarns in the upcoming part two. Thanks for joining us and spending your time with us today. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did. I was really thrilled with all of our guests today. I yeah. think it's terrific. And our new segment, Meet the Sheep, yep, yep. the Shepherdess. <laughs> <laughs> Meet the Shepherdess, yeah. I love working with such great people. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for being with us. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Bye. Bye. Over the years, you've collaborated with several fashion houses, and including Cabbages and Roses, Meadham Kirchhoff, Mark Fast, Jupiter Japan, Paul Hardy, Nike, Topshop Unique. That's a lot of names. So briefly, just tell us how did that all start? And then talk about a couple of the collaborations that you were particularly thrilled about. Well, it was extraordinary, really, Andrea, because I was sat in my studio in St Andrews and there was this little knock at the door and this young guy came in with this rather large suitcase and said, are you dying? I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I, I, I've come to talk to you about what you do, about your knitting. I'm really interested. So we spent about 40 minutes. I was showing him different designs and how I work. And, and I thought, well, he he's maybe wants to um, commission something or knit something himself, you know. Um, I'm showing the yarns and everything. And then he suddenly kind of stopped and said... Right, he said, I'd better introduce myself. I'm Paul Hardy. I'm a Canadian fashion designer and I really would like to work with you. And I kind of sat down and he opened the suitcase and brought out all this fabric and drawings and um, sketches of designs. And he said, I really want to collaborate with you and for you to make me some special hand knit pieces to go with this collection for next autumn winter. So I thought this is really exciting. So I said, yeah, OK. So the inspiration behind his, um, his work for that season was the Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe. And he asked me to make something special that the ice cream would have worn. So just at that point, I'd been reading about this amazing um, discovery on the steppelands in Russia of... Um, and I, a princess who'd been buried with her horses and all her special items in a little pouch, little carved deer and animals. And they'd discovered her in the permafrost and part of her skin on her shoulders and arms was still intact and 4,000 years old. 
and it was tattooed with these amazing animals and um, trees and flowers. And they decided that she was actually a princess with, who'd also been a warrior, but also a storyteller. And in my mind, the Snow Queen, the Ice Queen in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, she, she was a little bit too harsh for me. I wanted to make something for this particular princess. And so I had her as my muse, really. And I made with hand-spun Mongolian cashmere, which we had the cashmere imported to Scotland. And then a friend organised some spinners to spin it up to a particular weight for me. And I made this all-in-one piece, this um, shrug with a beautiful hood. And the back of the hood had lots of bobbles on it, so it hung down and sat beautifully. And I worked all the shoulders and down through the sleeves. It was knitted from cuff to cuff with lace patterns. So when it was worn over the bare skin, it looked like those amazing tattoos that the woman would have worn when she was riding through the steppe lands. So I kind of created a story and I created a person, a muse, and made that to fit. And it was a really successful collection. I made quite a few other pieces too. And we went on to make two or three more collections for Paul. It was a very exciting time. That's just such a stunning, vivid story. Mm. So much fun. I can just imagine that you would have been so inspired. There's, um, you've wor also worked with Graham Black. Yes, that was an amazing, amazing, one of the biggest projects um, that we've undertaken. And that was, it took six months. And it was to make a whole collection of hand knits in cashmere supplied by Erdos 1436, which is one of the big Chinese cashmere companies, um, to make them into hand knits, which um, represented um, the Scottish hand knitting tradition. And I don't think anybody had done it, anything like that up till then. And the main piece of the exhibition, which was for Edinburgh Fashion Week and for a catwalk show at the Royal Museum, was a full-length red ball gown, which Graham gave me free reign to create. And he gave me the shape and the form that he would like, and then I filled in all the bits. So we made this beautiful Sheila, who um, is my right-hand woman. She made the intarsia bodice section, which was made so that nothing need to be worn underneath. It was fitted perfectly um, to the human shape. And on that, I created like a tabard of um, Scottish flowers and symbols, including um, a lovely rose de design based on Macintosh's roses and a Scotch thistle, and all with ribbons running, running through it. And then from the bodice, we created this massive, beautiful lace skirt section, which was, I used the traditional Shetland lace techniques to create it and knitted the lace so that the rose pattern on it actually stood in 3D out from the knitting. And as this expanded out to make the full ball gown shape, um, we increased the pattern and increased the size of the roses and added in at the bottom hundreds and hundreds of bobbles in the pattern um, using an Estonian knitter, lace knitter, to create the final section because that's very much an Estonian tradition to put the bobbles in with the lace. It added weight to the skirt so that when, when it was worn with the beautiful taffeta silk under the skirt, it would float. And, and bounce down down the catwalk, which was really exciting. And the back was covered in lace, and the sleeves were all in lace too. So it was all, it was actually virtually seamless in the end, and quite extraordinary. We even got a mention in Vogue, which was a, a real high point. Absolutely, that's it's an amazing combination of a whole lot of knitting techniques, isn't it? Yes. Yes, and yes. in order for you to be able to work together with these top fashion houses as well as on their catwalk collection, as well as private commissions, you actually have around 30 highly skilled knitters working with you in your mm. studio, which we is do. very interesting. So I think you're going to introduce Sheila Greenwell to us now because Sheila is responsible for training and organising all of these knitters. So it'll be very interesting to hear yeah. what she has to say. 
Absolutely. Sheila is, you know, um, we couldn't do what we do without Sheila and, you know, and the team. And it's really important to us, you know, to get that, get everything right, all the difficult tension work and the complicated making. Hi, so this is Sheila, who works with me and is my right hand woman. <laughs> and <laughs> she, um, Sheila, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is how do you choose you know, some of our knitters, because we have some fabulous knitters in our team. We do indeed. I think they're all, I think they're all fabulous. I invite people uh, to knit a sample from a chart. I talk to them. I speak to them on, on the phone, by email. I learn as much as I can about them, and I look at their work. Um, I look particularly at the edges, and I'm looking for neatness and accuracy and a good gauge above all tension tension yes, is one tension. of the things that tension. is absolutely key to making when you're at a couture level so do you want to talk about tension Sheila because it's one of our big <laughs> tension big is, bears. tension is tension is a big thing with us um, and we have found in the past that not just achieving the correct tension at the beginning of a piece, but also managing to knit your way through sometimes quite large pieces and keep the same tension can be a struggle for some people. So we remind people always to keep checking their tension. Uh, and this is this is one of the, the very important things. And actually, we're very lucky in having a a core of knitters who have knitted with us for quite a few years now, and they know exactly the tension that, that we need. We knit in our own lamb's wool, usually, for our favourite designer, and so they know exactly what they should be doing. We've got a piece here from La Fetiche, which is the company we're working with at the moment. This is a Ziggy, and as you can see, we're using traditional ferrile techniques but then we're also um, breaking down the fair isle in the top section to give it a very abstracted look. Um, and the way this is constructed is really quite complex, isn't it? It, it is indeed. It, it has several bands, even at the sides, which you won't be able to, to see because they're in black. So it has several layers which hold it together and stop it flapping about mm -hmm. uh, but also then when it when it goes to the, the studio the designer's studio it will be fitted with a leather fastening mm -hmm. on one which, side which we won't see because mm -hmm. we don't we do not do that bit obviously mm -hmm. it also has special construction around the neck with a separate neck band knitted in i should say at this point that for our work for this label di and i do all the finishing in-house in our own studio so our knitters knit and we do the sewing up and the finishing that way as the pieces leave our studio every piece looks as similar as it possibly can to all the others yeah and we have to be very careful about sizing sizing is really key so we may have up to five sizes in one garment um so everything has to be really carefully graded and that's where the tension has to be perfect to match the measurements. Um, so we're checking all the time. We check every piece all the time, you know, back, front, sleeves, um, to make sure that it all fits together. There's a lot of sewing up with some of these pieces, um, especially sewing and over embroidery sometimes as well, which we do in the studio. But that makes them unique and really special. And we're absolutely delighted that, you know, our, our, our name is on the Lafitiche label, and they're very happy to talk about the collaboration with us. So Sheila, I think one thing that really intrigues people is when a knitter comes to you and they haven't they haven't quite got up to scratch with the piece of work that they're doing, what do you do? do you, how do you train them? What, do you, what What's your approach to that? Well, I always try to have a finished piece. I work on a lot of these pieces myself. I always try to have a finished piece that we can use as a comparison so that the knitter can see immediately where there might be a, something that isn't quite right. Edges are one of edges, the big things. Edges are one of the big things. If, if someone has 
um, very loose edge stitches, then the garment is, is not going to be the right size when we sew it up. So one of the things I write on most of the patterns is please take particular care with your edge stitches and if you feel that they are too loose, then twist them. Twist the stitch at the beginning and end of the row and that will tighten up the edges. Well, thank you, Sheila, so much for coming on the show. It was really great to hear from you. I'm sure the viewers are going to appreciate hearing your little bits of knitting wisdom. I would love to be taken under your wing and learn a few things. So now I want to talk briefly about your yarn because you've recently developed your own Scottish yarn. It's the Larland Lamb's Wool. So say something briefly about that. And then I can see that you've used it on the designs behind you. So talk a little bit about those designs as well. I had had quite a lot of experience developing yarns for different people. And I'd um, developed the Rowan Scottish Tweed um, about 10 years ago with one of the Harris Tweed Mills. And that had been a fantastic learning experience for me, finding out how to um, develop different weights of yarns and all the amazing colours. So about five years ago, I thought it's about time I developed a yarn for us and with a Scottish provenance, and but with a delightful softness that was very contemporary and modern, so it didn't have an itchy side to it. Um, so working with a local mill in Kinross, I developed this lamb's wool, which is a tutu ply, and then I developed an extra twist which is put in at Laxton's in Yorkshire, where it's balled and steamed for us. And this gives it, when it's knitted, a fantastic stitch definition. So it's wonderful for Gansey stitch work. It's wonderful in cabling. It's actually wonderful in Fair Isle or in Tarsia and even lace work. And we've now got about 21 colours in it. And each of the colour reflects an aspect of Scotland that I particularly love. This particular colour is Har, and where we live, we get this wonderful misty blue early morning, early mornings with the, just hovering over the sea, you get this sort of mist. And it really is this colour, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, we've also got in here, we've got the qual, which is a Gallic word for um, the forest floor, the colour of the forest floor. And that's that beautiful soft green. And in here we've got driftwood and the har and the wonderful flame which actually looks like um, the coral inside um, a scallop. So we've got 21 colours and we've developed some really beautiful patterns with stories all within them, because I do love, you know, kind of everything to be linked together. This particular design started life um, for Graham Black for the Edinburgh Fashion Week. And I was imagining walking through a forest in dark in the dark winter where it's snowy and the branches are all bare and crisp and looking through the branches and seeing a glimpse of a stag stood quietly in the distance and so I developed this into the pattern here with the stag's horns coming up here and all the twisted branches here and um because my imagination does tend to run a bit wild at times <laughs> At the same time, I found this, I, I found this gold torque beside a stone on the path, and that's the neck piece represents that. It's a Celtic torque that would have been worn, um, you know, about three, four thousand years ago. And, and to pull it all together, I developed this amazing back um, with one of my special techniques where I knit out of the surface fabric. And then I can plait and interweave the different pieces of knit to have an overlaid texture, which in this case pulls the garment in and gives it a beautiful peplum. So it's actually like a corset. It's acting like a corset in a traditional garment. So that's, that's the oak, which is a real favourite of mine. And then this is a new design, which um, this is the geo. And... Um, last year at the Shetland Wool Week, I was asked to create a piece for the fashion show, and this is what came out of it. I was trying to re-examine Fair Isle, the OXO pattern, and rather than knit it in two-colour Fair Isle, 
I decided to make the shapes in cabling and then add the colour in the layers going through it, as you would find in a geo. And a geo is a cut into a cliff which has been eroded by the sea. And there you can see all the strata and layers of rocks running through it. So the layers in here represent those different layers of the strata in a geo on Shetland, which you find in Shetland. And I've used some traditional one-on-one -on -one fair isle patterning for the bottom and for the, for the cuff. And it's all knitted seamlessly with um, grafted underarms. And I've also used different needle sizes to give it a beautiful shape in the body so that it actually flares out and gives, again, a lovely, very gentle pet plum. The colours, too, were inspired by me being snowed in at home for four days when I was finishing the neck piece here. And I was looking out of our... We've got a very beautiful Scandinavian-style window looking out at the, at the, at the um, landscape and all the snow. And again, I kind of got carried away imagining myself skiing through um, Sweden in a beautiful landscape. And suddenly I thought, I have got to have some of the har in here. And, and so the Scandinavian kind of dream kind of leapt into the colour scheme of the, of the piece. And we're really, we love this piece as well. They're both beautiful designs. And I just love hearing how you, your thought process, it's really exciting. I love the way your mind is working and the pictures, the imageries, it's almost like you, you make a little mental, mental movie and, and that's the yes. inspiration for your designs. Yeah. I can really relate to that. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So look, we have to finish. I'd love to stay and talk in a lot more depth about a lot of the things that we've covered today, but we just have to keep it to a certain time length. So just to end, can you um, answer in about two or three sentences, just um, so based on all your years of working in the industry, what's your best advice to upcoming designers? Uh, when you're working to really marry the right stitch with the right yarn to make sure that they work together beautifully. And when you're designing, consider every stitch. As, you, as you've got them on the needle and you put your, your needle in to the new stitch, actually ask the stitch, what do you want to do? Where do you want to be? How do you want to be? And trust yourself, your mind, to give you an answer because it's all there within us. It's just having the trust and confidence to, to, to develop our own patterns and thoughts and processes. To always be authentic, to always create stories that are about that are real, that are about yourself or the person you're working with, that put that adds more love and interest into the design and people will will feel it coming off the piece of work that you've made. That's a brilliant answer. That's, that's so true. And just very quickly, I love what you said about looking at every single stitch because people don't do that. And that's so similar to music. When you're studying music is every single note. You have to love every note. Yes. Every note is of, of great importance and has to have the same emotion into it. And, and you're saying that Absolutely. with every stitch is just to take the time and look at that and, and then it's yes. going to come out really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So that's a stunning answer. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's, it's so like music. You know, knitting and music have huge yes. similarities. Yeah. yeah. So we have to say goodbye to the audience, but thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a total privilege and honour for us. It's been absolutely lovely, Andrea. Thank you so much for asking me. That's really kind. Good. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye.
Thank you. 